So let's uh, dive in. Let's dive in. So we just read uh, from uh, Luke. Um, there's three accounts in the Bible. Uh, we have four Gospels, but only three of them actually give an account of Jesus' birth and uh, the story of Christmas. And of course, uh, we just read from uh, one. Luke 2 is probably the most famous one. Um, uh, and, uh, and so we, we read there, uh, and we... Uh, we learn about this uh, story of uh, Mary and Joseph uh, just about getting to town to Bethlehem and they could not find a place where they could uh, give uh, birth to that baby and of course uh, they had to go there it would be normally irresponsible to travel like this but they had to by the commandment of the government uh, they had to register because of taxes and uh, stuff like that. So they came to Bethlehem and they couldn't find a place in the inn. I would like us to, to, to keep that in mind. Uh, there was no place in the inn. Uh, but you know what? Uh, <laughs> uh, I just, the reason I want to emphasize, the reason I want to bring it up is uh, don't, don't you have that feeling when we go and talk to people and try to bring the gospel that uh, often the door is closed? You know, in some ways, it's just a picture of that. And so I just, I just thought that's kind of neat. Uh, and it's not like there is an ill um, a feeling against uh, Christianity always. People are maybe just gone, right? So I don't want to uh, blame for everybody that doesn't open a door uh, to Christianity. Or sometimes people are just a little bit careful and somebody knocks on the door, who knows? And, you know, maybe there is a bad experience, right? Or maybe people are just busy, or maybe the TV is too loud, so they can't even hear the knocking, right? But remember, uh, the, the, the door knock can be fairly quiet. It's not going to be quiet as, uh, as, as like a subtle or something like that. Jesus is not, uh, you know, you can barely hear it. I mean, yeah, there's going to be a knock yeah, on, on a door. Uh, but uh, there may not be anybody to open the door. And uh, uh, obviously, here what happened, they, they got there. It was so busy in town. There was a lot of other people that showed up uh, for the taxation. And of course, the first people that show up booked the rooms in the inn. So there was no room left. Uh, and so they eventually ended up um, in a barn uh, giving birth to the babies, at least somewhere. And, uh, and so we have uh, from that uh, the nativity scene with the... Uh, cattle and sheep and goats. Uh, but let me ask you this. If, uh, would you open the door? Let's say you are that innkeeper or somebody. Would you open the door knowing that actually who is being born here? I mean, if you knew, if you were the innkeeper or anybody in that town, if you knew who is being born, you'd move out of your bedroom. Quickly clean it. It's like, please go to my room, right? But that's uh, not how God comes. God is a very glorious God. But when He comes, He comes, you know, as, as a normal being. Uh, one of my favorite movies, I haven't seen it for a long time, is a movie, Brubaker. I don't know if you guys have seen it. It's with Paul Newman. And uh, it's an old movie. And the guy basically is appointed to be a director of a prison. And uh, he is, he's a very reputable guy. He's a great guy. And... Uh, and there was a lot of corruption in prison, uh, a lot of uh, abuse and so on going on. And so somebody from really high appoints this guy to kind of be the director. But the way he chooses to come to the prison, he, is, he wants to be brought there as a prisoner. And so he is, uh, he's kind of seeing from, uh, things from within. And then, uh, and then halfway in the movie, he reveals that actually he's the director. And, and you should see the faces of the prison guards, and it was like, and there were a lot of evil people. And you, you should see their faces, like when they, you know, realize that, uh, you know, he is actually the director of the prison. And it just reminds me a little bit of the story of Jesus. You know, Jesus comes, and he doesn't, he 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 allows to be a joke, isn't he a joke, Jesus? You know, people think it's a fairy tale. Uh, people think, uh, some, some people just openly laugh at it. And Jesus is okay with that. Because that's how he entered the world. I mean, he is going to be revealed with all his glory. But he decided to come uh, to a situation where there's no human place in the inn. 
Yeah? And so whoever receives Christ have to receive him as those people that receive him to the bar, at least something. And that's good enough uh, for Christ. Now the second account is in Matthew. Um, in Matthew chapter 1, we have, uh, um, uh, we have another uh, look at this. It's a little bit different uh, emphasis and a little bit different approach. Uh, so let's look at that. Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. We read, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. That's a chapter 1 of Matthew, verse 18. When his mother, Mary, was espoused to Joseph before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. Now let me just interrupt that. Uh, so these two people, Mary and Joseph, they were espoused. Now today we maybe use the term engaged. So they were not necessarily, uh, they didn't consummate the marriage just yet, but they were already committed one to another. And uh, so in that uh, sense, they were already treating one another as a husband and wife, even though they didn't consummate a marriage just yet. All right. They, they were not intimate one with another. But now Mary is actually pregnant. Now, if that happens to you, man, you know what happened. Right. And it's the end of that. That's the end. All right. And so the Bible tells us that he he was a good guy and uh, the, what she has done in his mind, of course, we know she didn't do it, but what she would have done if that would happen in normal situation is a very shameful thing. And perhaps some man would, would make a story out of it. But Joseph was a very discreet man. And I think, it's, I th I think Joseph was a very good character. And so what he decided, instead of making a big story about it and put it in a newspaper, he said, okay, we'll just hush, hush. You just go back to the life, and I'll go after mine, and we'll just not make a big deal. But I'm, I'm sure he was quite hurt by, by this uh, realization, all right? Uh, but while he thought on these things, that's verse 20, um, Behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And he, she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, uh, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife, and knew her not, till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. And so that's the story about, and the emphasis on the fact that Jesus comes from a, a girl that never was with a man. So she is a virgin. And um, in, uh, there's a dispute among the so-called scholars. All right. Uh, obviously, if you tell this story to to just a lost person or whatever, it's a joke. Ha, 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 right, yeah, 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 child born of a virgin, okay, have a nice day, right? It's a, it's a joke. Uh, but you know what, uh, among uh, people it may be a joke, but hey, it's a joke among the scholars. You know, there's a lot of scholars, you know, they scratch their beard and they, they look at the Bible and they look at the original and they say, well, it's not really what it says in the original, it doesn't mean virgin, it just means a young girl, right? And in fact, in some translations, they change it from virgin to a young maiden or uh, that sort of thing. Um, but listen, this whole thing falls apart if Jesus is not born from virgin. It's, it's a must. And I'll demonstrate. It's be very important as we, as we travel through this, uh, through this sermon. Um, what happened inside that womb is critical. And, um, and we will we'll discuss that a little bit later. But remember, Jesus must come out of virgin, or and as it will appear later, uh, or this whole thing uh, falls apart. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, we have this odd uh, judgment against the devil. Because remember, the devil deceived uh, mankind through uh, the woman. 
and uh, tempted her, and she ate that uh, fruit from that tree of knowledge, good, of e good and evil, and then she gave it to her husband, and so on. Uh, when God came and passed judgments, uh, then he spoke to the devil, and he said to him, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, he says, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. Now remember, we're just talking about virgin birth. We're going to a little bit look at how life actually starts medically and biologically, all right? Uh, but I want you to notice certain terms here. He says that he will, God says, that he will put enmity. Enmity means fight enemy. He's going to make them enemies. Uh, between thy seed, which is the seed of the devil, which tells me that the devil has a seed, right? All right? There is a seed of the devil. And there is also a seed of the woman. And there is going to be enmity between the two. And it shall bruise thy head. You know, the seed will, will bruise the head of the devil. And thou shalt bruise his heel. Now, it's interesting that man is not mentioned here. You know, this is a deal between the woman and the devil. All right? And uh, it's, the, it's her seed and, and it's, its seed. So just keep that in mind. Isaiah 7.14, remember when the Bible says, when we read from Matthew, it says, as it was spoken by the Lord of the prophet, it quotes actually Isaiah. And we find it in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. And it says there, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold a virgin. It's not the young maiden. All right. Uh, they, they argue that, well, basically, it's just a young girl that is able to bear a child. That's what it means. No, it just means a girl that never was with a man, virgin. And, um, um, and she shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. And so that is quoted in Matthew. And Matthew does that a lot. He quotes a lot of, old, a lot of scriptures from the Old Testament. Now, the other scripture that I want to uh, emphasize is from two chapters farther to the right, Isaiah chapter 9. Uh, this promise is elaborated on, and this is what became part of the Handel's Messiah uh, musical. Uh, uh, it says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government and peace shall there be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform it. So this boy, this child that is born is king. And we're not talking about some great guy that's just going to one day uh, grow up and be a king, and then he's going to die. Somebody goes after him. No, this is a... Remember, I said, when the Bible says something, it's really a big deal. So if the Bible says the king, then it's the king. It's, it's, it's the king. It's the king of the world. Now, we believe in uh, Jesus coming from uh, Virgin Mary. All right? Now, I want to just, as a disclaimer, we don't believe in immaculate conception. Well, which, is, which is taught in the Catholic Church. Uh, the, the idea of immaculate conception means that uh, Mary herself was sinless. All right? Well, that's not true. Mary was just another person, and, uh, and she definitely was a sinner. Uh, she had to ask God for forgiveness, and I believe she was saved. All right? She was not immaculate. It's not an immaculate conception that, that way. You know what? The way they come, the, the reason they do that is because they really want to have that female element in uh, the uh, origin of Son of God, uh, which is really pagan. I mean, this is not a new concept. It's been around for a long time. You always have some kind of heavenly deity and then some kind of earthly uh, woman, and they get together, and out of it comes this hero. All right? That, that's not a new thing. And I believe that actually has some uh, ground in the scripture, which I'm not going to go into today. But um, Mary... Uh, indeed was a sinner, uh, redeemed, but she, was, uh, she had the grace uh, and uh, uh, a blessing to become 
uh, the caregiver to Jesus. And also they say this, Jesus is the son of God, right? So uh, we know that father is God, so he is the son of God, but he is also uh, a son of Mary, meaning then that Mary is the mother of God, you know? And so this logical construct is fault. Uh, she is not necessarily the origin of uh, uh, the son of God, you know? She, she is just a caregiver. So she's not the mother in a true sense, like uh, let's say a normal mother is. You know, a father comes and a mother comes together and there goes the, uh, a child. Uh, and of course it comes from his parents. Uh, so in that sense, uh, Jesus is fully God. He's not half God and half man. He's a fully God and he's a fully man, all right? So I just wanna uh, clarify that just in case this is not clear. Now the third account is a little bit subtle. And we find it, of course, in the Gospel of John. Mark is the one that skips the story and it goes straight to uh, basically Ch uh, Jesus' uh, later years. Uh, so the third thing that, that, that I want to emphasize from the scripture. So we already talked about there's no place in the inn. Uh, Jesus comes very humbly, unnoticed as something fairly mundane. Uh, second, we learn that Jesus is uh, coming from a virgin. Uh, and the third thing is from John. So let's look at what John says about that. Uh, that we find in chapter 1 of John, Gospel of John. And we read this. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. So this is uh, uh, something we, we already touched on. First of all, Jesus is a, is a very important figure. Uh, he actually created the world. Through Jesus, everything was created. Uh, but we learn here that the world knew him not. All right. So when uh, he came, we, we keep reading, he came unto his own, and his own received him not. Right. This is the idea of coming to Bethlehem, and you're just another person out there. But actually, Son of God just is being born here. You know, it's a, it's, it's a, the, there's no more important event in the history. This competes only with another event, and that's a resurrection. But there's no more important event that you can, you know. But there's a lot of important people that lived in those days, right? Uh, but they didn't realize that the real events were happening in some Bethlehem. And of course, from uh, last Sunday, you remember, I mentioned that Bethlehem was very, very base city. It was not really reputable. It's one of the lowest of uh, the thousands of towns in Bethlehem, in Judah. <laughs> But as many as received him to them, he gave power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Now we're talking about here about being born. Now, here we're not talking about being born, you know, Jesus being born, but we're talking about uh, people being born. All right. We're talking about not just birth of Jesus, but birth of sons of God, other people, all right? And it's a different kind of birth. It's not a birth that uh, we're going to have in about three weeks. It's a birth uh, of a different kind. Um, and it's not of the flesh, which is the physical birth, but this is a different sort of birth. And it's, it's not of will, will of man, but of God. So. Uh, keep that in mind. This is kind of where I'm going with all this. And then verse 14. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory, the glory of as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And that is the title of my sermon. The word was made flesh. That's the title of my sermon. That's the emphasis I'm going to uh, uh, talk about today. And why is it important? And how great it is a deal, all right? The Word was made flesh. We'll, we'll, we'll look at it, what it means. Now, clearly, the Bible speaks about the Word. Uh, and it clearly says that the Word is Jesus, all right? The Word is Jesus. Now, this is not some kind of poetry or, or symbology or some kind of, um, you know, picture of something. This, this is literal. This is, this, just, this is exactly what it means. The word was made flesh. It's a very short sentence, and every word 
counts. It, it, it means what it says. Um, uh, and by the way, that Mary it was virgin is therefore not an error. You know, something happened in her womb that, that make it unique. And that had to be from her being virgin. That Mary was impregnated some other miraculous way that normally a woman is impregnated by. Uh, and there was a word. The word was made flesh. Now, the, in the Bible, actually, the word often relates to Jesus. All right, this is not the first time. Uh, from the beginning of the Bible, there is quite a few uh, scriptures. Now, first of all, if you just go to the first chapter of the Bible, you go to Genesis chapter 1, you know, the Bible says, at the beginning, God created heaven and earth. And then it goes on to say, in just chapter si in verse 6, it says, and God said, right? And you know that, 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 that a lot of things that were created, day one, day two, day three, and so on, it always starts with, and God said, and God said, and God said, and God said, all right? And um, so uh, uh, it's, a, it's an important element uh, uh, that we need to consider that everything that was made is made by God, by Him speaking, by His Word. All right. Another scripture, of course, is from John. So we go back to John chapter 1, right from the beginning of that chapter. It says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. There's something with the Word. Something with the Word. There's something divine about this Word. And the Bible says, The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. Okay, we're talking about the Word, right? Everything was made by the Word. But now it starts saying everything was made by Him. So now it's a male, right? It doesn't say her or it. It says it was made by Him. <clears throat> and without Him was not anything made that was made. So everything that there is was made by Him, the Word. And the Word is Jesus. It's not, it's not a joke. It's not a... Poetry, it's not exaggeration. It literally means, uh, means that. <clears throat> now let's uh, look at uh, 1 John. Uh, that's the Epistle of John. 1 John chapter 1. Um, actually, you don't have to go there. I'll just read it quickly. It's another ex expression of the, the word. The Bible says there, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled, of the word of life. And it describes Jesus. And it's the word of life. That's exactly what we have seen before. The life and everything that there is, all the life in this world, whether it's plants, vegetation, or it's animals or humans, everything comes from the word. 1 John chapter 5, verse 7 is a famous uh, scripture on the Trinity. It describes that uh, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost are one. But let's see what it says. For there are three that bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word, right? It doesn't say the Son. It says the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. So indeed, Jesus is the Word. And the Word is Jesus. So if we see that in the Scripture, we see that the Word was made flesh. The Word already is Jesus, all right? It's not like uh, Jesus start being when uh, Mary becomes pregnant because some Word came. No, the Word was already Jesus and it just came there and then became flesh. And of course, in Revelation chapter 19, we see, And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. This is speaking again about Jesus in the future in his glorious uh, assumption of, uh, of his role as, as the king. And his eyes were as the flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. That's actually Jesus' name. We call him Jesus, we might as well call him the Word, the Word of God. And he has on his vesture and on his tie a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Now, this is another thing we learn about Christ. He's got many names, right? There's his name, is Jesus. 
Emmanuel, uh, the Word of God, uh, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, faithful, true, and these many different names. Um, <clears throat> now, what else do we refer to as the Word of God? The book, this book, right? We call that the Word of God, the Scripture, all right? Uh, listen, Jesus is the Word. That means the Word is Jesus, right? This is the Word. This is Jesus, right? It's just not in the flesh form. Now it's again as a Word. But this, the, when I figured it out, when I, I didn't figure it out, I learned it from somebody else. But when, I, when it clicked in me, there was like a really big day in my life. It's like, wow, that's amazing, right? It's a huge consequences of, of that uh, reality, that this is Jesus. What we read here is Christ. The Word is the Bible. That means that the Bible is Christ. It's a very important doctrine. And so, in other words, when we read the Word became flesh, we can read the Bible and we can see this is what became flesh. This, the, the, these pages, uh, whatever is written here from the beginning to the end, is the Word. All right? This is the Word. Now, what else do we know about this book? All right? There is a there is certain attributes we learn about the scripture. Basically, if this is Jesus, if this is Christ that actually became flesh, and we, we have the Christmas story, but it starts with this. Uh, if this is divine, then uh, it will have same attribute as God Himself. All right? God has a certain attribute. We know certain things about God. And I'm not gonna go through all of them, but I'll just highlight two. Uh, one thing we know about God, He is not corruptible. He's incorruptible. He cannot be um, corrupted. Now, what's a corruption? You know, if you put anything in a jar and just close it and then come and leave it in the sunlight or something and come one week later and open it, it's not going to be fun to smell, right? That's a corruption, right? Uh, if you just build something and just leave it alone, don't touch it or use it maybe, well, what's going to happen to it? Is it going to get better? It never does, all right? That's the whole idea of uh, second law of thermodynamics and entropy. Everything always goes to chaos. Everything goes to corruption and, uh, and uh, back to the state of uh, chaos. Let's look at Psalm, verse, uh, chapter 16. Six, Psalm 16. We find there uh, something about uh, the Son of God and corruption. How does that go together? Uh, Psalm 16.8. I have said the Lord always, Psalm 16, verse 8. I have said the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. Therefore, my heart is glad, and my glory rejoiceth. My flesh also shall rest in hope. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell. Neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. This is a prayer of David. Uh, but it's prophetic, all right? He is uh, praying because he, he, he is righteous. Now, David knows that his righteousness doesn't come from him being a wonderful guy. David knows that his righteousness is important from God. God, you know, you cannot get righteousness just being a good person. The only way to get righteous is to is, is get, receive it as a gift because none of us are righteous. I mean, everybody is a sinner here. I am a sinner. I'm a great sinner. I've sinned thousands of times, all right? And I'll sin again. Um, but um, Jesus never sinned, you know? And if, if I know very well that I'm a sinner, how could I claim myself that I'm a righteous person, you know? Uh, I go deep and I know I'm not, you know? So the righteousness that I have is just because God gave it to me. It's just a free gift, all right? David has it, but he speaks about, it's actually prophetic. When he sees that, when he, when he says there, that uh, uh, when he's speaking to God, that will suffer thine holy one not to see corruption. And of course, we know that Jesus, upon his crucifixion and death, he went to hell. And Jesus, uh, remember, people came to Jesus and they say, give us a sign. Can you, can you just show us a sign? And he says, oh, wicked and wretched generation, always seek after sign." Right? But there will not be sign given except the sign of Jonah. And what happened with Jonah? Jonah was a disobedient man, and as a result of a sin, 
not being obedient to God, he ended up being thrown into a wild and raging sea and was swallowed by a fish. And he was in that fish for three days and three nights, somewhere at the bottom. And, we, and that is a picture. It's, that, that's a, that was actually not the hell, but it was a picture of hell. Uh, who of us would like to experience that story? <laughs> you know, that must be terrible. Now, if I at least knew that it's going to end three days later, maybe that would be a little bit helpful, right? Kind of like going through uh, the scary castle in some kind of entertainment park. You know, in the end, it's going gonna, it's gonna to last only 10 more minutes, and then it's over, you know? But this guy didn't know it's going to end, right? I mean, it was an open-ended. He might, have, he might as well die. But Jesus says, just like Jonah was in the belly of the fish, so is the Son of Man will be three days and three nights, and then he's going to be released. And this is, uh, what it's, this is the same thing. Thou will not suffer thy Holy One to see corruption. And when you go to hell, you're there because of your corruption, and you suffer corruption. You're being burned. Uh, it's just like uh, when you take gold or silver, some precious thing. You put it in a fire, and you burn everything that needs to be burned. And then the pure thing comes out. But the thing is, that if I was thrown into fire, everything will burn, right? It's not, you know, it's like that rapture, yeah? Like everybody is <laughs> gone, it's just a little ring, you know? If, if I was uh, subject to, to fire, it would be all gone, right? But when Jesus was subject to fire, everything remained. Not a single bit was burned, not a corruption. And um, this is what we know about Jesus. Jesus went to hell, and that's speaking about this book, this book. You can throw it in a fire, of course, I'm talking about uh, here symbology. But if you turn this into quote-unquote fire, it won't touch this because this is incorruptible book. It cannot be burned. And again, I'm not talking about this particular thing. I, I can promise you that if you threw this into fire, it will burn completely. Uh, I'm talking about the, the word. You, I hope you understand what I'm saying. If you do see corruption in some Bible, well, then that's not the Bible. All right. Yeah, I'll tell you, this book, for example, right at the beginning, it says, at the beginning, God created the heaven and earth. You open some other Bible, it says, at the beginning, God created the heavens and earth. So right there, we have a problem, right? At the, at the beginning, whatever, you know, was it a 10, 10, 10 words already? And it's already a change. So somebody changed something. So only one of them is true. And I don't know why that one is so important, that they change it so much, you know. But there's many places like that in the scripture that people came and, and fiddled with it and changed it. Well, then that's not a word of God, because remember, God's word is incorruptible. And by changing words, making it from single to plural, uh, that's, that's a big deal. You don't, you don't touch God's word. It's very important. <clears throat> <clears throat> You know, Apostle Paul, he warned us, listen, be careful about the book. And there's many books, you know. You go to a Mormon religion, right? You have the Book of Mormon, right? That's a corruption. It's not a God's word. They pretend it's a God's word. It's not a God's word. Uh, you have the Gospel of uh, Barnabas and the Gospel of Thomas and the Gospel of Judas, of all people. Uh, and then you have the... Uh, the uh, Shepherd of Hermes, uh, and, and all these different extra biblical literature. That is not the word of God. Apostle Paul warns us, you know, if he that cometh preaches another Jesus, or if there is that we have not preached, or is there another spirit which we have not received, or another gospel which we have not accepted, you might well bear with him. The Bible teaches us that if somebody comes to us with slightly different version of things, and I'm not talking about rephrasing something, but you know, putting their little bit different things and changing it a little bit, that our duty, for our own sake, is to reject it. All right? We want to have pure, incorruptible Bible. We want to have a good word. And why am I talking about it so much? Remember, we're talking about the word that became flesh. It's important. All right, it's important. Now the next thing, next attribute, is God's word is preserved. And preserved, by preserve, I mean it's not changed. It's unchanged. The way it was at the beginning, that's how it is now. All right? So not only it doesn't go bad, but it doesn't, it doesn't just shift. You know, like the kids play the game, and, and they whisper to each other's ears some, some 
complicated message and in the end it becomes something completely different. Everybody has a, has a laugh uh, about that, right? So people have this idea that we don't have God's word anymore. It's long, long time ago. A oh, long time ago. You know, and there is no way we could... And you have all these archaeologists and scholars and they go and they always find some new thing and they, they're trying to recover what it could possibly said originally, you know, making it such a big deal that this whole book is already kind of corrupted and some things were lost. And so the Bible says that the Bible is preserved. Psalm 12, 6 is the best scripture I can think of for this topic. The words of the Lord are pure words. A silver tried in a furnace of earth purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Once God spoke it, it will never be gone. And it will be preserved in exactly the same way as he spoke it. Now, just because it is translated to a different language, that doesn't mean that it's no longer preserved because... I actually speak different languages, and I know that you can preserve the same thing going from one language to another, but you use, you, sometimes you use different kind of words because the, the structure of the language is very different. But you can preserve it. So when we talk about preservation, we're not talking about preservation of the paper on which it was written. but We're talking about preserving the message uh, to the core. Now, another thing about the Word of God, so we already learned it's incorruptible, and it's... Um, uh, preserved. The other thing is about God. We say that God is omnipotent, right? So there is uh, the idea of being potent. Potent means that it's a power, all right? Potential means power. So uh, another thing we know about God's word that it's very, very potent or very, very powerful. And scripture for that is in Isaiah 55. So if you go to Isaiah 55, verse 8, uh, this is what we read Isaiah 55. <clears throat> for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways, or your ways, my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain cometh down, and the snow from heaven, and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and maketh it bring forth, and but, that it may give seed to the sower, and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. The Bible says that when God speaks the word, and remember what happened with the word at the beginning of the world, this whole thing happened. So it is very, very powerful. No man has not even a close any kind of power uh, like this. God speaks it, and poof, there's sun. It's ridic ridiculously mind-boggling power that we cannot quite comprehend. And so God's word is powerful. And if he spoke this, if this is, this is what he spoke, he spoke it for a purpose. The Bible says it will not come void. This will accomplish something. And also, it will... Um, it will uh, prosper. So it's not, going to, it's not going to be sent out there and will come empty or with no effect. No, it will prosper. It will accomplish certain things. So that's another thing. We learn about God's Word, that it is powerful and it creates something. And uh, when we read in Isaiah chapter 55, it tells about that it waters the earth, it brings forth and bud, it gives seed, um, you know, there's the idea of uh, origin of something that lives. Uh, this is what we read in Matthew in Isaiah chapter 55. Now, let's a little bit talk about the origin of life in general, right? So, for life to exist, you need two key elements uh, in just about every form of life. You need a seed, and you need a womb or something receiving that seed. Okay. Now, this is true for just about all the forms of life on the earth. Um, the word seed, uh, let's say with animals and, and humans, uh, uh, we use the term sperm, which is just the Greek uh, version of the word seed. All right? It means the same thing. Uh, and you need uh, the seed or sperm unite 
uh, with uh, the egg or earth or, or whatever it is on the receiving end. Now, when it comes to vegetation, uh, the, the receiving end is the ground. Right? When it comes to animals, the receiving end, uh, receiving end is, the, is, is an egg or Latin ovum. All right? So you have those two have to unite and then it comes a new life. All right? Now this is not something we don't know, but this is, this is true uh, for plant. So anything, vegetation, that sort of thing. It's of course true for animals and mammals and birds and reptiles and all this stuff. Uh, but actually it's also true for human soul. And we'll talk about that. And then may, this is where I'm going with this, okay? It's true for human soul as well. Now, here's a few things that we learn about from the scripture, something about a seed. Now, first of all, the Bible tells us that for life to begin, the seed first must die, all right? And the Bible tells us that in uh, John 12, uh, verily, verily, 12, John 12, 24, verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn or wheat, now, we, when you use the word corn, we specifically refer to that plant called corn. But actually, corn means uh, just about any um, uh, cluster of seeds in, in just about any plant. And in, in this case, we're talking about wheat. So, except a corn or wheat fall into the ground and die. We're talking about seed. Except it goes into the ground and dies, it abideth alone. But if it die... It bringeth much fruit. It bringeth forth much fruit. So for seed to, 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 to pre, pre, uh, create life, uh, it has to be gone. Right? And we know that uh, you, know, you can do scientific project even at home. You can take a little uh, soya bean or something, put it in the ground, and maybe put all of them in the ground and kind of get there in the middle of the process. You can start seeing that it's no longer a seed anymore, but actually becomes, uh, and of course, when it grows up and you look for the seed, it's gone. It's not there anymore. It's destroyed, right? It's, it, it dies. So that's one thing you learned about seed. Uh, the other thing, uh, the other principle about life we learn, and, and that is that not all seeds that are, uh, that are uh, 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 available actually produce life. In fact, most of them don't, all right? Uh, not all seed produce. There are actually many seeds uh, that are given, but only few produce. And we see that everywhere. Now, in summer, you can go on, on a meadow and you can see a bunch of dandelions, right? Now, each dandelion, each little flower of dandelions has, I don't know how many seeds, 100 or something, you know? Now, how many flowers is there on that field? You know, maybe, maybe 10,000. So if each of them has 100 seeds, now we're at million. So what does that mean? Next year we're going to have a million and 10,000 flowers? You know? No, we're going to get again 10,000. You know? So majority of the seed, and in this case we're talking about a percent, I'm just guessing, uh, is 1% is only giving, uh, giving the fruit. All right? Most of the seed is actually that. And it's also true for animals and humans. You know? You know, there's a bunch of seed that uh, gets on, on the journey. But only one is going to make it, maybe two sometimes, three at the best. But it's also, it, it, most of them just die. You know, it's, it's over. And of course, you know the, the parable of uh, the, um, uh, the, the sower and the seed. You know, the Bible gives us uh, that parable in Matthew and Mark. Mark chapter 4, we have that story. You know, behold, there went out a sower to sow. And you know what happened. Uh, here we have a person that goes and spreads seeds around, right? And the Bible says that um, some fell here and some fell there, and some fell here and some fell there. But only some of those seeds fell in the good ground. Most other seeds perished. Either they were just destroyed by the sunshine, or they were picked up by birds, or they were kind of lost somewhere. Maybe some of them actually did uh, put some roots down, but then... It was just big trees and big brushes around that took all the nutrients and didn't allow sunshine to, to get in. So basically that thing just died. All right? But there is one seed that just goes into the fertile, good, ready land. And that seed actually produces. Now when the disciples ask about this, well, what do you mean by that? Well, what's, what's up with this problem? What, what are you trying to say? Then Jesus says, the sower soweth the word. Right? So he says, 
The seed is the word. All right. And these are they that be on the wayside uh, where the word is sown. But when they have heard, Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word. So this whole thing that Jesus said is very literal, but it's also a good picture of uh, the spiritually spiritual birth, the spiritual conception, uh, which also happens by the seed. But in this case, seed is the word. And let me remind you that we are talking about the seed that became flesh. And I, like I said, this is not some kind of uh, poetry. This is just as real as it says. So uh, here we can see that the word is the seed, the seed, the word, and so on. So God's word is compared to seed. And it gives us, therefore, the picture of how spiritual life starts. All right. Seed is united with the ready ground. What is the ready ground? Our heart. What is the seed? God's word. And this is how life starts. Um, uh, uh, of course, we, we know that scripture, that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Right. So those two are important. The seed has to come, which is the word of God, which is the book. It comes from somebody that brings the gospel. We hear it and it clicks. And then we react and we receive it and we come to God. We ask him, according to this book, you say that you will save me only if I just believe in you alone. I like the deal. Can I take it? Would you please save me? And God saves me. And that's how life starts. Spiritual life. That's how it starts. Um, <clears throat> so speaking about a word that is made flesh, in order for life to originate, to start, Seed must enter in. All right? Without it, not going to happen. But also, you need to receive in. You need to have a, a ready, uh, ready uh, re recipient, re re recipient of uh, that seed. Now, um, it's been like that, obviously, from the beginning. Everything that God started, started with God's word, the seed. All right? Uh, and of course, it's true physically. And of course, now, what is it, 60, 70 years now that we understand uh, what is the essence of us as a being? We, you, you dig deep down to the, the smallest part of your, of your cell, the cell, and you find their DNA. And literally, is a, is a handcraft is just an amazing, very long book. It, it is a, indeed a information. It literally is true that we are uh, actually... Uh, written or spoken, uh, there is a seed. So seed, if you have a seed that comes to, uh, whether it's a ground or to an egg, in the case of animals and humans, uh, it basically is a DNA. It's a carrier of a genetic information. And um, uh, isn't it interesting that if you go to the first uh, book of the Bible and speaks about the beginning and everything, it's called the book of Genesis, right? So because that's where everything starts, that's the that's the beginning. That's the essence of us. Um, and so this is not an accident that Jesus is made um, from a Virgin Mary because there is a different kind of seed that came to Mary. It's important that she's virgin. And it's important that, uh, that the word is made flesh. Therefore, it's also important that G G Jesus is not a descendant of Joseph. And he likes to remind that uh, uh, Joseph and Mary. Remember when he got lost? Well, he didn't get lost, but he got uh, delayed in Jerusalem when they were coming back uh, to Nazareth. And then they realized three days later that Jesus is not with them. And they came back, looked for him. When they found him, uh, they tell him, Luke chapter 2, verse 48, When they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, Son, what hast thou done? Uh, why hast thou thus dealt with us? How come you're not with us? Why did you, why did you do this to us? And he's, she says, Behold, thy father and I have saw thee sorrowing. You know, your daddy and I were looking for you. We we're, were troubled. Right? Why don't you tell us what's going on? And Jesus answers, How is it that you sought me? Wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? It's a gentle reminder, no, Joseph is not my daddy. My father in heaven is my daddy. All right. Uh, so that's very important. <clears throat> now, here's another thing about birth. 
that the Bible speaks about, also in John. Of course, we know there's a famous story about Nicodemus. And what does Jesus tell him? Uh, Jesus tells him, you must be born again. All right, we're talking about birth. Uh, Jesus uh, says in chapter 3, verse 5, Very, very, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. So here the Bible introduces the idea that there is two kinds of births. There is a physical birth, that we all go through it, but there is also a spiritual birth. Um, uh, it's a different kind. And uh, in both cases, there is going to be the seed and there's going to be the ready ground. All right. Now, in case of uh, humans, you have a male sperm and, of course, you have the f f female egg. You, they get together and you have a human being. In case of, uh, in case of uh, spiritual birth, you need the same thing. You need a seed, which the seed is the God's word, hopefully that we have established now. And the receiving end is our heart. When we hear it and we, we take it. You know, there's a lot, of, a lot of seeds out there. A lot of ideas and a lot of uh, concepts and uh, gospels and uh, uh, ideas. And, and, and certain people receive different things. And some people don't receive none of it or some of it they don't receive. You know, we are bombarded by all kinds of ideas. We're bombarded by lies from a devil, which we will talk about also. Uh, but when the right gospel comes, do we receive it or do we not, right? So Jesus was born also of the two. Jesus had the physical side of him, all right? We saw him. He had a flesh and blood. But also he was born of the spirit. He was spiritually alive, you know? So it's the same thing for all of us. We must be born these two ways. Otherwise, we're just a physical being. And we're not spiritual being. To be spiritual being, you must be born spiritually. And this is what Jesus told to John, uh, to Nicodemus. He says, "You must be born again." All right, different kind of birth. In uh, John chapter twelve, we, uh, you know, this is this this is the thing that we write about the corn that it has to die first uh, in order for uh, something new to come out of out of it. And he says, except a corn or wheat fall into the ground and die, abideth it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. He that loveth his life shall lose it. And he that hated his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. If any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. And so the Bible clearly says here that we must... You know, the first, the physical, must die in order for the spiritual to live. Now, if we don't want to die, if we want to preserve the physical, then the spiritual is not going to happen, right? This, this life has to go. And uh, it's essential that, that this has to happen. Now, this, Jesus uh, here speaks about his death. And he, he says, you know, I must die. He, so even Jesus had to die. The physical had to die. And uh, remember, this is where Jesus uh, was rebuked by Peter. Oh, no, no, don't you do that. And of course, Jesus rebuked him back. Get behind me, Satan. I, I want to go through this because I want uh, this new thing to come out. So then comes a new life, new birth, new plant or new man. It's only possible when the first one is gone away. Now, let me tell you this. We're talking about Christmas here. We're celebrating Jesus' birth. We're celebrating Jesus' physical birth, all right? But there is a, so this is a Christmas. I'll call it first Christmas. But there's also second Christmas, okay? And this is, the, the, by the way, this sermon might as well be preached on, a, on the Easter, uh, you know, when we're celebrating the resurrection of Christ. Because what happened on uh, the day of resurrection, Jesus is sort of born again. Right? He is born into a very different body. Remember what happened with Jesus, right? Jesus uh, uh, suddenly shows up in a room, in the middle of the room. Now, I don't care. Anybody can laugh at it as, as much as they, they want, but uh, the Bible says that, and I trust it. So Jesus, the, the disciples were in the room. Nobody opened the door. Suddenly Jesus is in, in, the, in their midst. All right? It's a different body that we don't understand. All right? 
So the, of course, the, it's a big deal to have a first, the first Christmas. You know, what we sing about and uh, Noel and all these things. It's a great thing, away in a manger, the baby is born. It's a celebration of Christ's birth, his flesh and blood, hallelujah, right? But even a bigger deal is, of course, this, the celebration of, so to speak, a second birth when Jesus is born into a new body. Um, but listen, there is more to this second body than just the fact that Jesus had a new body. Uh, the Bible says in Mark 4, 20, when it speaks about the sower and the seed, right? when he speaks about the seed that falls into the ground, and then a new plant comes out, right? But that's the, not the only thing that we learn from it. There is a ripple effect that comes from that. And the ripple, ripple effect is, um, is here, Mark 4, 20. And these are they which are sown on good ground, such as hear the word and receive it, and bring forth fruit, some thirtyfold, some sixty, and some an hundred. And so Jesus is the seed. <clears throat> Jesus is uh, the seed that was planted. It died. New life came out. And out of it comes many, many fruits. Many new lives come out of that. All right? So this is what I call the ripple effect of Jesus uh, being born, living the life, physical life, then he died, then he's resurrected into new body. And the ripple effect is that there is more fruits that come out of it, just like we can think of apples or, or wheat or anything like that. Now, let's talk about conception and, and from conception to birth. What are the steps that happen? So first of all, there is a conception. All right? And we talked about conception right now a lot, about seed and an egg. So when the seed enters into the ground or an egg, you know, this is a one-time event, right? I mean, maybe there is a lot of, um, a lot of uh, hearing, but then when it comes, finally, enters in, this is, you know, this is the moment, right? I just learned that actually when, uh, when a sperm enters a... Uh, an egg, there's actually a release of, uh, I think, zinc uh, all over the egg, and it actually is just human, very quickly, it, and, and it actually shines light. Uh, it's, it's interesting. And what it, what it does, it actually kind of encapsulates the egg from receiving any other seed. Uh, so it's pretty amazing how this is done. Uh, but um, it is uh, literally, uh, you can actually observe it under microscope if you do it in the laboratory. You know, when, when, when that uh, event happens, there's this blink, you know. And uh, so it's a one-time event. You, you receive the gospel and you become a new being. All right? Now, what follows conception is, of course, a period of pregnancy. All right? Uh, new life is already there, it's growing, it's being nurtured, it's being protected. And of course, it's very wonderful what's happening inside there, right? We don't peek in there, but we, we just see the result when it comes after the pregnancy. The process lasts about 40 weeks for humans. And, um, and, uh, and then comes the third stage, which is the birth, all right? Now, the birth is, again, one-time event, right? So one time event conception, then there is a process of growing, pregnancy, and then there is a one time event birth. Now about birth. Birth is what's happened with the birth. The pregnancy is not the same throughout the whole uh, time. You know, I don't want to go into deep stuff, but one thing we notice, it grows, right? It grows and it gets bigger and bigger. And I think towards the end, the baby is quite stuck there. Right? There is a less and less space to move in, right? And then it comes a period where you have start where you start having pains, you know, signals that something is up and something is coming. So you have a birth pains. And uh, some of them are fake. Uh, and, and, um, and of course, there is a certain inconvenience. I don't have to remind my wife about that. Uh, that, that comes with it. You get more tired, you, you can't walk as far, it, it hurts, and so on. The bird itself is also very intense. It's not really pleasant, uh, uh, but it's a transformation of one life, one stage of life, to another stage of life. It's still the same life, the same person inside, but it's of one form to another form. One form that's nice, but the other form is better. All right. 
And then, of course, uh, then, if, then a man is born, or a woman, a child is born, right? And uh, the, the life is fully formed, and it's time to reveal it. And then we see the face and find out if it's a boy or girl, and so on. Now, Bible speaks about birth pains and, uh, and birth, uh, about the real thing uh, in, in many places, but also speaks about birth in a figurative way, all right? And um, in relation uh, to what I want to talk about, it, there's quite a few scripture that uh, the Bible speaks about, uh, where the Bible speaks about uh, the second coming of the Lord, about the resurrection of the believers, about um, what I would call the ripple second Christmas, all right? Now, there's quite a few scripture. I can't go through all of them just for the sake of time. Uh, but for example, Romans chapter 8, Bible says, For I reckon that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. This is in Romans chapter 8, verse 18. <clears throat> the expectation of the creature waited for the manifestation of the sons of God. The creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who has subjected the same in hope, because the creature itself also shall be delivered. And then verse 22, For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. Now these are terms that are applied to a woman that's just about to give a birth. All right? There's a groaning and travailing and there's a pain uh, because there is coming to this point of some great transformation. All right? And that's, that's in the books. It's coming. John chapter 16, verse 20. Verily, verily, I say unto you, that ye shall weep and lament, but the world shall rejoice. And ye shall be sorrowful, but your sorrow shall be turned into joy. A woman, when she is in travail, has sorrow, because her hour, her hour is come. But as soon as she is delivered over the child, she remembers no more the anguish for joy that a man is born into the world. All right? So he's using that picture quite vividly here. And then he says, And ye know therefore have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart shall rejoice, and your joy no man taketh away from you. So the coming of the Lord is clearly compared to the picture of being pregnant and having going through pains and suffering. But then when that day comes and happens, that suffering is going to be gone, and a new child comes out. Um, Revelation 12, there appeared a grave under in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she, being with child, cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. That picture there in the Old Testament, in, in Revelation, uh, which sometimes we have a hard time to understand, again speaks about deliverance of a child. So the birth pains in the scripture refer to, um, refer to uh, tribulation that we have in this world. All right. So if we go back to this idea of conception, pregnancy, and, and birth, where are we now? Well, first of all, conception. This is where everything has to start. All right? One has to receive the word of God and react to it and become a new being. All right? Then comes the period of pregnancy. And this is where we are now. We are not done. We're not done. We are alive. We are alive. But we are not quite completely happy. I don't know if you are. I'm not. All right? I want this to be better. All right? But this is going to happen when that birth day one day comes. And of course, um, the way it comes that the seed, this body, has to Go away. In either I'm going to die, but then I'm going to live uh, in this new body. Or if Jesus comes and I am still alive, then my body is going to be just transformed into a new body. The uh, Bible speaks about it. And of course, the birth and delivery, that is a picture of resurrection, of uh, Jesus coming to this world and, uh, and uh, taking us from uh, this state of, of life to another. Now, 
why is all this important? And why am I talking about it? Um, the Bible speaks about Christ and his body. You know, the second Christmas, what I call. Uh, there is a lot of stuff in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians especially. Uh, Apostle Paul has a lot of references to uh, church and people being uh, the body and temple of God. Temple <coughs> means the same thing as body, by the way, okay? So if there is a temple in Jerusalem, there was a temple in Jerusalem, it was a sort of a picture of body. All right. If there was a tabernacle in the wilderness, it was a picture of a body. Of course, all kinds of religions have temples. Uh, it's, just, it's just silly fake. All right. Just because somebody built some building and calls it a temple doesn't make it a temple. All right. Uh, but uh, the real temple is basically, for example, I, I show you here, this is actually a temple. This is a sort of a house, and I live in here, inside. Right? I am in there. So my body is a temple. Jesus also has a body. All right? And that body is now being made. We are in a pregnancy stage. And we are the body. And uh, just, like my, just like when you look at the child being formed in the, in the womb of the woman, it consists of several parts and cells. Right? And they all are independent, but they all work together and they form one body. And so are we. As long as we are this new being, this born-again creature, then we all are body on our own, but we are actually part of a big body. All of us. All right? Um, uh, the, the Bible says in uh, Corinthians 3.16, Know ye not that you are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If any man defile the temple of God, God him destroy. The God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, and you are the temple. You are the body. All right? Uh, chapter 6, verse 19. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? 1 Corinthians 12. For as the body is one, and as many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body. So also is Christ. So here is the concept that even though you have one body, you have different members. And of course, if you look at your nail, it's very different from your eye cells. And your eye cells are very different from your blood cells. Right? Huge difference. And they're all together, form one body. For the body is not one member, but many, the Bible says. 1 Corinthians 15, 50. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I'll show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Changed of what? Changed of one kind of a body to a different kind of body. The seed must die. And one type, you know, if you, if you go look at the seed, it looks a certain way. And the thing that comes out of it is so different. You know, there used to be a belief, if, uh, if you look at the human sperm, there used to be a belief, I think some French... Uh, uh, philosopher thought that uh, that actually the sperm is basically a miniature human being you know but it's not true uh, you can even tell unless you really know uh, obviously the science and you can count chromosomes and stuff like that but if you just look at it under microscope it doesn't even look close in fact you probably could not recognize human seed from uh, let's say seed of a frog you know Maybe even the frog seed may look more human uh, than the human seed, right? So you cannot really tell. It's very different. Um, it has to go. It has to die. Um, Philippians chapter 3. For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our wild body. Now let's just be honest with ourselves. Obviously when we come, you know, I put a nice suit on. And we try to present ourselves in a you know, nice way. And we take a shower in the morning and comb our hair and wash ourselves. But you know yourself that your, your body is... And when I mean body, I don't mean just a physical body, but also your tendencies and your little habits that you are not proud of. And being overweight or maybe too skinny or whatever you do, you find imperfect about yourself, right? The Bible speaks about this as the wild body. All right? That's a wild body. And the Bible says that this must be changed. 
this has to go away. This is reminded us, that's like that seed. And that's the good news. That's the good news, that God will take you who is inside that body, and he's going to take you, and even though your body is going to die, he's going to protect that and take it to the new body. And you're going to be in that new body. And that old, wild body is going to be gone. That it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body. It's so silly to think that Christmas is just about crackling fire. It's about, it's about changing you to, and, and make you a, just just new being, completely new being in, in the future. Ephesians chapter 5. We are members of his body and of his flesh and of his bones. For this cause shall man leave his father and mother, and shall he join unto his wife, and they shall uh, they, they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Now the Bible speaks there about the relationship between husband and wife in a marriage. But the Bible tells us that what I'm really talking about is about Jesus and his church. And so we are the bride, we are the body, and Jesus is the husband, he's the head, he's the counterpart, and we are, of course, united. Ephesians chapter 2. Now, therefore, verse 19. Now, therefore, you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. This is another term for temple, body. And you are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being a chief cornerstone. So we have the idea of a temple, the building, where you have a chief cornerstone and you have a foundation, which is the apostles and prophets in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth into holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are built together for an habitation of God through Christ, through Spirit, excuse me. And one more. Uh, Peter says, 1 Peter second, uh, chapter 2, Ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer spiritual, spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God. So, all over the place, the Bible tells us that we, all of us, are part of this body. And let me take you back to what I was saying at the beginning. The Word became flesh. The Word, spiritually, we accepted the Word. We got born again, as Jesus uh, said to Nicodemus. We received it, and now we are being formed as in a womb. It's, this is not it. It's not, you know, it's a good place to be when you are five months old as, a, as, a, as an infant, as a, as a fetus. But um, that's not what life is about. You're just being prepared for something. The real thing is going to happen after you are born. And by the way, the period of pregnancy is relatively short, isn't it? You know, it's actually long enough, but, you know, the life that happens after it is real life when you start breeding. And when you, when you, you know, when you start growing and so on, experiencing this world. So, with that, let's be also careful about another thing. There's also an enemy. And the enemy um, comes with an attack and a different seed. All right? Uh, that's something to be very, very careful about. Uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, as an example, tells us, Be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us. He says, look, I gave you a good gospel, but there's going to be people that are going to pretend like it's my letter, and they're going to try to tell you something. And uh, they will come and, for example, they will say, hey, the day of the Lord is at hand. Meaning the resurrection is already here. All right? It's kind of like you're pregnant for one week and it's like, okay, it's going to be born already. Right? And so they, they tell you that this is going to happen right any moment. And he says, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed. 
the son of perdition, who opposes and exalted himself about all that is called God, or that is worship, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. There is somebody, and of course we know who it is. We know that's the devil. The Satan is trying to infiltrate, is trying to get in, because he wants to be that head. He wants to be in, that, in our body. And he wants to come in and, and take charge, become the king and whatever. He always wanted that. Look at Isaiah 14, 12, and you'll see that was always his plan, to be in charge. And the Bible says, be careful, be careful. Um, um, and by the way, this Jewish idea that they're going to build and that many Christians unfortunately support, that uh, there has to be a temple in Jerusalem. Look, if they build some building one day and they call it a temple, I promise you it's not going to be temple. Because temple is something that somebody lives in. In the best case, or I don't know, best case or worst case scenario, maybe it will be a temple, but definitely not of God from heaven. Because you know God already has a temple. You know what a temple is? You are the temple. This is the temple. He lives in me. And by the way, the temple is the church. You know, I am part of the body. Glenn is part of the body. Noemi is part of that. Daniel, you know, Mark, you know, we are part of the body. We all have a different functions. We sometimes don't understand each other. You know, you know the blood cell looks at the nail cell and it's like, what the heck look like? You know, why don't you look like me? Right? We are very different, but we form one body. This is the temple. And so the Bible speaks that there will be one day uh, abomination of desolation, you know, uh, the, the one that's not supposed to sit in the temple. Forget about some building. It's going to be somebody in the church and perhaps in a human body that's going to try to sit there. Uh, that's what we should, should watch. <clears throat> Matthew 13, 24, we have another parable uh, speaking on the same uh, issue of the enemy. The Bible tells us about this parable of a man sowing a good seed, you know, but then at night when nobody's watching, an enemy comes and throw there some other seed because he hates the guy. You know, the guy is successful. He's producing very good uh, wheat and he's got always tons of, tons of stuff at the end of the season. And I just hate the guy, and I want him to not be so successful. So I'm going to go, and I'm going to throw there some other seed, but nobody's looking. And after a while, it, it, it becomes apparent. Oh, my goodness, somebody throw here a different kind of seed. Well, the Bible tells us that God knows his seed. And so he will let it grow together. Obviously, that's not pretty picture. But he will let it grow together, and then there's going to be a filtration. There's going to be separation of the good seed from the bad seed. So God knows who are his. But still, we need to know that the enemy is out there uh, to plant his seed, and we ought to protect, uh, again, using this scripture to check whatever comes our way, whether it's true or not. Now, in closing, in closing, God's word, we talk about God's word became flesh, all right? And uh, how important it is. God's word is what makes the body of Christ, the church. It is God's word. This is what creates it. Uh, so what does that mean? That means that we ought to take this Bible and treat it with absolute care. And don't fool around with it, right? Um, the Bible says in Revelation chapter 22, great warning to us. And he says this, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David. You know, that's basically a reference to seed. Jesus says, I am the seed. And I'm also the bride and morning star. And the spirit and the bride say, come. And let him that heareth say, come. And let him that is athirst, come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of the book, if any man shall add unto these things, or if any man will take away from these things, that there is a great judgment. 
God will take away your life from the book of life. God will punish you. Don't fool around with God's word. Leave it as it is. But then the Bible says that he, will, he which testify these things said, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Come. We're waiting and we're calling Jesus, come, for the second time when this pregnancy is finally going to end and there's going to be a birth. And we'll come out of this. And it's going, to be, it's going to be the thing, the great thing we're looking for. So what we are seeing when it comes to Christmas is a little bit of a snippet of a great news. It comes humbly. It comes unnoticed, perhaps. And then, of course, we live in a life of tribulation and all kinds of troubles. But the promise that is given to us is that this day will come. And the second Christmas, the ripple effect is going to demonstrate, and we will be the Christmas. We will be the child born in complete newness, complete uh, um, beauty as God created, with no more trouble uh, from then uh, forward. So let's continue, by the way, as Christians, let's be like this over, right? Let's continue to see. Do you see a lot of people not receiving you? Hey, Jesus was born in a barn, right? Don't be surprised. Think about the dandelions. How many dandelions have seed? Only maybe one receives it, you know? Uh, and it's always nice to hear stories how somebody goes to, it's always in Africa. Somebody goes to Africa and there is all these people that come and they become Christians suddenly. I don't know. I, I'm a little bit skeptical about that. I think uh, typically what happens is that, uh, you know, in the case of human, I think it's like a millions of seed uh, get on the journey and only one make it. Right? So let's not be surprised if maybe a lot of people don't receive the message and leave the door closed. All right? That's just normal. Um, but the, there is a commission there for a purpose. There is some reason why it's there. Go, you know, why? Because the body is being built. And um, uh, listen, if uh, people are busy, the door is closed and we reject it, then let's look for a room in a barn. This is why Jesus said, you know, go to the highways and hedges. You know I mean? Let's go anywhere, you know. And if this kick us out of the apartment building, let's go to another apartment building, right? We uh, won't give up. Uh, we keep looking for the lost soul. So that's Christmas. Isn't that good news of magnificent proportions? You know, I realize that people love to sit down with the family and have a turkey dinner and all that stuff, but uh, something awesome and great happened at night. And uh, I always find it amazing how, how this guy, this Caesar, this powerful person, so powerful that he can say, hey, everybody has to now go to your hometown and register. And he thinks he's some kind of big shot, but he means nothing. What means something is that little Jesus that was born, and he was born in Bethlehem as it was prophesied, and you know what? The whole world can go all against Christianity and against the Bible. But all they're going to do is just accelerate the birth of Christ second time. Amen? Amen? That is the good news. That's the Christmas. Let's just bow our heads and pray. Dear Lord, I thank you very much that we have this wonderful promise that indeed uh, your word became flesh. I'm, I'm happy that through this word I can be saved, that I can uh, be a part of the body, and I, I no longer fear the death. I'm, I, I'm not looking forward to the process of dying, obviously, and, uh, but, but I know that uh, even though I pass one day, I know where I'm going, and I thank you that uh, you are preparing this glorious day when uh, you are going to come, your church will be resurrected. People that are still alive will be transformed into a new body. And there will no more be crying and trouble, but we'll live in our full potential, full new body uh, for eternity with you. That is a wonderful message of Christmas. I thank you for that. No wonder there's been so many happy songs about that. And Lord, teach us, Lord, to never forget the, the purpose of Christmas. 
not be sidetracked by Santa Claus or some other vanities of this world, but let's remember what your uh, birth is very much about. In Jesus' name, amen.